also going to have a option of uh, watching it on the screen. So yeah, and I was impressed now. by the uh, <clears throat> last week by the physician about the dangers of eating in a restaurant indoors as opposed to eating outdoors. Right. And, and uh, I'm not going to take that risk, but I have been to a number of outdoor places where, which I think greatly lowers the risk. John, has anybody looked to see how the Metropolitan Club is doing? Uh, I've been in touch with the Metropolitan Club and they want us, oh, the Metropolitan, I'm sorry, the Metropolitan Club. Um, you know, they were, they have been meeting, they've been doing their programs from the boathouse, but with only a handful of people from it. Now they were supposed to start, I, well, maybe it was this week, I think they're supposed to actually be allowing more people into the meeting. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how many go and how many uh, uh, do it. But you know, they, they've been, as I said, they've been doing their programs from there for about a month, but the program were with just a handful of people in the room. They weren't a full audience. Um, so. Um, it'll be curious to see how many people they join. I don't know the answer to that question, but I think, I think it might be this week that they're planning to allow a bigger group of people in to their meetings. I think you're right on that. I guess some observation I've made over the weekend doing some shopping is, you know, the, the wearing masks thing and the huge difference is whether people have children with them. The people with children have got masks on them and their children. And when you think about your kid laying there in a bed with a ventilator on him, might or might not die, I think you, you take it all a lot serious, a lot more seriously than single folks who complain that their bar life is being interrupted by safety. Uh, I, I kind of was interesting. I, I have another, I have another uh, product placement. It's my son who works in the emergency room in, uh, in Denver. So we're promoting the idea of Mary wearing masks so he doesn't have to treat so many people. <laughs> there you go, that's good. Well, and on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and start the meeting here. So it is five after, so here comes the bell. All right, tone that down a little bit. Well, thank you everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's great to see so many faces once again on our Zoom meeting here. Um, I'm gonna call on uh, Carol Family. Carol, can you have the invocation and pledge for us today? Yes, you know, the pledge was written in 1892 by uh, Richard Bellamy, he was a socialist, and it's been changed about four times, added, words added, or changed since then. So I'll recite what is today's Pledge of Allegiance. A pledge of Allegiance to the flag in the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Um, in a few words about the invocation, I, I, get, I suppose we all uh, think it's, uh, a good time to pray for peace. And um, I think that uh, that peace starts with us. And uh, so we should offer, any, do anything we can do to, to, cr to create peacefulness around us and around those uh, close to us. So with that, um, you may bow your heads. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to understand, to be understood as to understand, and to be loved as to love. For it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and in dying to self that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Carl. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and do a few of our Zoom reminders. So if you haven't already, if you're not on the program, please mute your uh, uh, yourself there. Um, keep in mind that even when you're muted, if your uh, video is on, that uh, you're, you're showing and lots of people are seeing what you're doing even. So some people forget that uh, and they, they do some things that uh, are entertaining, perhaps. Uh, anyhow, a couple reminders there for the programs. Um, so our meeting next week will be a club assembly. So the first one in over a year, we're gonna be uh, doing covering lots of different businesses. It'll, it'll be the last full meeting that I uh, am in charge of. Then we're gonna have the, uh, following the change in the guard the week after that. But next week we'll be discussing things as our strategic plan. We're gonna, you know, CHIP is ready to fully implement it starting uh, July 1st and ready to roll with it. So we're gonna be talking about that, talking about some of the goals and some of the accountability standards that we're uh, trying to raise here. 
Uh, I mentioned the change of guard. It's going to be held on June 29th. Uh, be my last meeting to start, and Chip will be running the meeting by the end. Um, you know, we're going to install the officers and the club directors. We're going to try to incorporate some of our historical uh, traditions. You know, it, it, we aren't going to be able to do them all. Obviously, we, we have things historically where we pass the things from one past president to another. That's not going to happen, but we're going to involve some of the past presidents as part of the presentation. So, you know, I hope you can still join us and see our uh, at least efforts to continue the traditions, even if they're uh, uh, not done quite the same way. Um, we want to thank everybody who's responded to their invoice. We've had good reply. Uh, if you didn't respond by last Friday, we resent them out. Uh, so hopefully you'll, you'll do that. It is best for everybody. If you can pay electronically, that makes it easiest. It about, has less handling of things for our, our staff and others. Uh, so encourage you to pay your dues. They're, they're, uh, they are due, obviously, by the end of the month there. Uh, and and then actually, I told some a few people, and, and I don't normally do the jokes myself, but John Hay, one of our long-term members, sent me a joke this week. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share one that John uh, John sent to me. Uh, a woman walked into a bank in New York City, and she wanted to borrow $10,000. A loan officer asked about collateral, and she said she had a new Rolls Royce titled to her with no liens. The officer said that was a bit odd for a small loan, but, you know, it would do. It would work. So the paperwork was done and the branch manu manager told the minions to park the car in the bank's garage and put yellow tape around it. The woman came back into the bank a few weeks later and said she wanted to pay off the loan. The loan officer was perplexed but did the paperwork and said she owed $17 in interest. She wrote a check for $10,017. The officer said, gee man, when you came in two weeks ago, we checked you out and found out you're a moly millionaire and couldn't figure out why you would need to borrow $10,000. She said, oh, I decided that I want to go to Europe for a few weeks and where else can uh, you park a car for two weeks for only $17? <laughs> All right, so with, with that, we're going to uh, move on and uh, I'm gonna call him. So Mike, I beat you to the joke, but Mike Schettinger has got a few more for us. So he's gonna give us some quarantine blues, Mike. That was taking a big chance there, John, knowing who was up next, I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yes, I actually have accumulated two weeks worth of humor since I, we didn't have time last week, but I will only do one. Um, but I did want everyone to know that I hope they give us two weeks notice before sending us back into the real world. I think we'll all need the time to become ourselves again. And by ourselves, I mean, lose 10 pounds, cut our hair, and get used to not drinking at 9 a.m. Breaking news, wearing a mask inside your home is now highly recommended, not so much to stop COVID-19, but to stop eating. I stepped on my scale this morning. It said, please practice social distancing, but I was the only person in the room. And then I looked down and it said, only one person at a time on the scale. It takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a vineyard to homeschool one. I actually used that once before, but I liked it so much I used it again. For the second part of this quarantine, do we have to stay with the same family or are we allowed to relocate? I'm asking for a friend. Not to brag, but I haven't been late to anything in over eight weeks. People keep asking, is the coronavirus really all that serious? Listen, y'all, the churches and casinos are closed. When was the last time heaven and hell agreed on the same thing? It's probably getting serious. Never in a million years could I have imagined I could go up to a bank teller wearing a mask and ask for money. I am putting a drink in each room of my house today and calling it a pub crawl. Speaking of alcohol, a meal without wine is now called breakfast. What, or I'm sorry, wine improves with age. The older I get it, the more I like it. No, I didn't do that right. The older I get, the better I like it. Sorry about that. People say that drinking milk makes you stronger. Drink five glasses of milk and try to move a wall. You can't. But now drink five glasses of wine and the wall moves all by itself. The secret of enjoying a good wine, open the bottle and allow it to breathe. If it does not look like it's breathing, give it mouth to mouth. And finally, the other day someone told me that I could make ice cubes with leftover wine. I was confused. What is leftover wine? And that's my report. Thank you, Mike. Well, you're actually up next if you want to do the introduction of our speaker here. So keep oh, going. I can do that. All right. Let me find it here. Um, 
Yes. Today we are uh, uh, excited to have, if you remember, the last few years we've had somebody affiliated with the Cleveland Federal Reserve Bank speak to us, and they've done a great job of kind of letting us know what's going on, and we thought it would be uh, real timely to hear some more about that. So today we have Guhan Venkatu. He is a group vice president in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. He leads the department's regional analysis and outreach group. Uh, Guhan joined the Federal uh, or Cleveland Reserve Bank in 1998 as a research analyst. In his tenure with the bank, he has held positions of increasing responsibility, including economist and vice president and senior regional officer of the bank's Pittsburgh branch. He is a graduate of Leadership Pittsburgh and previously served as a member of the Ohio Governor's Council of Economic Environments. And most importantly, he received his undergraduate and graduate degrees in economics from Miami University. Go Red Skins. Right? Were you a Red Skin or a Red Hawk, Guhan? I was, I was a Red Skin. All right. Well, welcome Which to Columbus Rotary. Old, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is a great pleasure to be with you all today. Um, and as you can see from my haircut, Mike's jokes are uh, right on point in my case. Uh, I do have a slide deck, so I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I can try to share my screen um, if that's the best approach. Yeah, Guhan, if you can't do it, I have it downloaded as well, but I have it, uh, you're able to share your screen. Okay. Let me give that a shot. <coughs> Sorry, give me just a second here. All right. Can you see the deck now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. Okay, great. All right, so let me know if you have any trouble seeing the slideshow or hearing me at any point. Um, again, it's very nice to be with you all this afternoon. Um, and I should note that the views I'm about to share uh, are my own and not necessarily those of my far more capable colleagues uh, throughout the Federal Reserve System. Um, I also wanted to say before I begin that I'll be talking about two things throughout the course of my remarks, growth and levels. And I, I, I realized after I'd put the deck together that I may not have done a good job of clearly distinguishing between the two. Um, so let me try to do this up front. With respect to growth, um, I think there are clearly some signs that it's increased, and I'll talk about that as we get into the presentation, and that's clearly a hopeful sign. Um, I also think that this might suggest that some of the policy measures that were undertaken have helped to maintain spending. Uh, so for example, things like the CARES Act stimulus checks, enhanced and expanded UI benefits, low mortgage auto and other consumer interest rates, and businesses being able to access credit, all of those things um, have helped to let's say keep residential rental payments up uh, and mortgage delinquencies down. Uh, they've also helped to support housing and auto demand and have supported modest recoveries in restaurant uh, and retail spending. That in turn has helped the associated businesses. But economic activity levels remain low despite significant stimulus, which again, I'll talk through uh, as we get into the deck. Uh, and given the depth of the declines, it seems unlikely to me that we will recover to pre-pandemic levels of output and employment uh, anytime soon. So if you are still listening after I've revealed the punchline of this talk, um, let me begin by acknowledging what in some sense was big news last week, although in other ways totally anticipated um, by anyone paying even a little bit of attention. So last week, the Business Cycle Dating Committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research determined that the most recent U.S. economic expansion ended in February. In their announcement, they noted that February marked the end of an economic expansion 
that began in June of 2009, which of course followed the Great Recession, and that this expansion, which lasted 128 months or more than 10 and a half years, was the longest in US history dating back to the mid 1800s. The previous record, which was 10 years, was held by the economic expansion that spanned much of the 1990s uh, and a bit of the new century. Um, that there's been a turn in the economic environment is very evident, of course, in the GDP data that we have for the first quarter that's shown here on this chart. Uh, the news is that the announcement from the NBER came so swiftly. That's a sign of how abrupt and severe the current change in economic conditions has been. Uh, so to take one example, with respect to the previous downturn, the Great Recession, it was about a year before the committee made an official announcement, as opposed to weeks or months in this case. In terms of GDP growth for the first quarter, that fell at an annual rate of 5%. Uh, that's shown here on the slide again. That's the largest decline that we've seen since the fourth quarter of 2008, a time, of course, when the global financial crisis was intensifying. You might recall that in the month just prior to the start of the fourth quarter of 2008, we witnessed one of the catalyzing events of that crisis, the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, as well as the federal takeover of AIG. So where are we headed? There are a variety of forecasts out there for the current quarter, that is to say the second quarter, nearly all of which suggest staggering declines. The projections I'm showing you here are relatively recent estimates from the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, in late May, they expected that GDP would fall at an annualized rate of nearly 40% in the second quarter. They do anticipate a bounce back in the second half of the year, but still expect overall output to be down about 5% in 2020. Um, I'll return to the longer term projections provided by Fed policymakers last week toward the end of the talk, but to put the CBO's Q2 projection in some context, the largest quarterly decline we've observed in the post-World War II period, essentially since modern statistics on U.S. output have been produced, is 10% in the first quarter of 1958. That happens to be another period during which the U.S. was experiencing a pandemic as it happens. So unlike the, B the NBER's confirmation that we are in a recession, what was something of a genuine surprise is what we learned about the labor market in May. The labor market data for the first month of the second quarter, so April, clearly showed the impact that the public health emergency had had on households with the unemployment rate rising to the highest level since the Second World War, nearly 15%, after it had fallen to the lowest levels in roughly a half century during the economic expansion that just ended. Incidentally, Ohio's unemployment rate in April also rose to its highest level, 16.8%, the highest level ever recorded. That was more than two percentage points higher than the national average and ranked sixth among all states. The Columbus area's unemployment rate, by contrast, was below the national average at about 14%. We'll get the May data for these two geographies soon at the end of this week for Ohio uh, and on June 1st for Columbus. But turning back to the US data, the data for May caught most economists and analysts, including me, uh, off guard. The US unemployment rate in May fell by more than a percentage point to 13.3%. So should we take that as a sign that a quick recovery to the pre-pandemic economy, um, to pre-pandemic economic output levels is in the offing? Unfortunately, I think, referring back to the first slide I put up, the short answer to that question is, so why do I say that? The employment data, which come from a separate survey and are plotted here, showed the same sort of improvement in US labor market conditions suggested by the decline in the unemployment rate. But after at first being surprised, a look at the industry level of detail made me think that this wasn't really a surprise after all. We saw meaningful increases in the industries that had been most affected by the pandemic and that state shutdowns um, had caused, where state shutdowns had caused activity to be curtailed. So for example, restaurants, which couldn't accommodate any in-person diners in April in Ohio and other states, uh, and accounted for about a quarter of the job losses during April, of course, began to reopen in May, and accordingly, we saw an increase in employment. 
restaurants alone accounted for about half of the employment increases recorded in May. We saw similar partial recoveries in retail, manufacturing, construction, and healthcare. One aside on this, Ohio's restaurants couldn't reopen for in-person dining till the 22nd of May, well after the survey that underlie these data were collected. It may be that restaurants were calling workers back earlier in the month to prepare for reopening. It may also be that the PPP program, despite all of its frustrations, actually allowed firms to rehire workers even when they weren't yet operating. Indeed, our own internal surveys from early May showed that about two thirds of PPP recipients had staff levels comparable to pre-pandemic levels, whereas this was closer to about 45% for non-PPP recipients. So in any case, uh, while the recovery that we saw in May is clearly good news, I think it's worth remembering just how deep the decline in employment has been, has been rather. So again, back to the distinction between growth and levels. So to take restaurants again, employment in this sector has fallen by nearly 5 million jobs since February. That's including the recent gains that we saw in May. When you include hotels in this category, employment has fallen by more than, sorry, nearly 6 million jobs or just about 40% for the sector as a whole since February. While activity at restaurants seems to have improved as state shutdowns were lifted, credit card transactions data suggests that spending at uh, small restaurants remains about half of what it was in February. In addition, employment levels in retail, healthcare, manufacturing, construction, transportation, and administrative and waste services, all of which employ significant proportions of lower wage workers, remain at around 10% uh, or more below their February levels, and overall employment levels are about 13% below where they were in February. So for context, that's more than twice the percentage decline in employment, roughly 6%, we suffered through the course of the Great Recession. And these declines are short-term cyclical changes. Over the longer term, I think we're also likely to see some structural changes. So what's on this slide, slide summarizes the views of David Otter, an, an economist at MIT, who also thinks that there may be lasting changes to the labor market post COVID-19. And, and that these developments are likely to put more pressure on workers with relatively fewer skills and lower wages. So first he thinks that people will remain worried about being in close proximity to others for some time to come, certainly till there's a vaccine or other effective treatment. The result will be less work for those who help to maintain these physical spaces, such as cleaning crews, as well as service associates at restaurants uh, and retail outlets, something that's clearly evident in the employment data that we have at this point. Second, he thinks that companies will discover, as so often happens during downturns, that technological improvements since the last recession actually allowed them to do more with fewer workers, which will also depress the demand for labor and typically lower skill label, labor. Uh, third, he thinks that the financial stress of the crisis could weed out smaller and medium-sized companies with larger entities taking more market share. These larger companies tend to be better capitalized and so are also likely to use less labor for the same amount of output. And fourth, he thinks that businesses will discover that the amount of travel they've asked their employees to do in the past is simply no longer necessary. Uh, that's true not only for business travel in the traditional sense, but also for travel to the office. In both cases, the service workers who support this in hotels, restaurants, retail outlets may be much less in demand uh, after the COVID crisis. What's particularly heartbreaking about this is that lower skill workers have finally started to see some improvements in their income growth in recent years as the long economic expansion that just ended had worn on. This income growth among lower wage workers was clearly set back by recent developments. A recently released Fed study indicated that among people who were working in February, almost 40% of households making less than $40,000 a year lost a job during the month of March. Indeed, when we look at unemployment rates by educational attainment shown here, uh, we can see that the stress has been most acute for those who don't have a college degree and who again tend to, learn, tend to earn uh, lower wages. 
According to Otter's analysis, these individuals may also bear the brunt of the longer term changes that could result uh, from the COVID-19 crisis. But turning back to the medium term, let me talk through consumption, production, and housing at a high level to give you some sense for what we're seeing in the data and where we might be, uh, what we might be in for rather going forward. So with respect to retail sales, data for the first month of the second quarter set a new record for monthly declines. So retail sales fell 16% in April, the largest monthly decline ever recorded, displacing the previous record decline of 8% uh, that was registered in March. Prior to the most recent two months of data, the largest decline was negative 6.5% uh, recorded in January of 1987. By category, the largest declines were in things that might be thought of as most discretionary, so apparel, furniture, electronics, sporting goods. These categories saw monthly declines ranging from negative 30 to negative 80 percent. Some what less discretionary categories, such as sales of gas stations, general merchandisers, restaurants, saw declines ranging from 20 to 30 percent, uh, while the least pronounced declines, categories such as sales of gas stations, general merch under 20%, came in categories one might think of as offering necessities. So things like drugstores, grocery stores, and home supply stores. One surprising decline was associated, or at least in my mind, was associated with motor vehicles. These sales fell a comparatively more modest 12% in April, though they saw a much steeper 26% decline during March. We do have data from May at this point on auto sales. They bounced back to just over 12 and a half million units at an annual rate, but that of course is well below the 17 million or so units that the industry has sold in each of the last three years. Uh, so we'll get an official update uh, to the retail sales data tomorrow, but there are a few more frequent measures we can examine to get some sense for how consumers have fared more recently. Uh, the data charted here shows seated diners according to the open table reservation service, which show some recovery from where we were several weeks ago, but this measure is still down 70% from this time a year ago. With respect to travel-related measures, uh, these also appear to have seen some modest recovery with hotel revenues down about 65% relative to a year ago versus approximately 85% uh, relative to a year ago as of mid-April. And throughput at US airports is now about 85% below the levels of a year ago, um, and that's an improvement from being down roughly 95% from year ago levels in mid-April. And finally, and perhaps most um, reassuring, we've seen consumption of gasoline start to um, increase uh, meaningfully in recent weeks as, again, state shutdowns have abated. As far as production, the Industrial Production Index also registered a record decline in April. After falling 5% in March, the total index fell 11% in April. That's the largest monthly decline on record, with these records going back to the early 1920s. Uh, similarly, the manufacturing sub-index, which accounts for about three quarters of the total index, fell 14% in April after declining 6% in March. That too was the largest decline ever recorded for this sub-index. Within manufacturing, auto-related production fell an astonishing 72%, as most assembly facilities were shuttered while non-auto related production fell 10%. We'll also get an update to these data for May tomorrow. The declines I noted for auto production are of course of particular consequence uh, to those of us in the Buckeye State. Uh, Ohio produces about a million of the 10 and a half million units produced annually in the United States uh, over the course of the last several years. More broadly, manufacturers tell us that while they have backlogs to work through, their order books are not filling up. That's evident in the ISM survey data, where the index for new orders is around 30, suggesting that the vast majority of firms saw their orders fall further in May, a worrisome sign for the future. The same thing is true in construction, where the longer term issues I mentioned a moment ago are likely to keep activity related to office and retail construction limited for the time being. So one piece of evidence on this comes from an index of architectural activity associated with future commercial construction. Similar to the new orders index I mentioned for manufacturing, this measure came in at about 30 in April, apparently a new all-time low. 
as far as residential real estate housing starts have slowed significantly relative to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, the level of both total and single family housing starts in April was about 60% of what it was in February and roughly 60% of what we saw, say for those two aggregates last year. That said, purchase mortgage application uh, activity, which fell in early April to the lowest level since 2015, has risen for several weeks and is essentially at the average application levels recorded through the first two months of 2020, a sign that low mortgage rates may be helping to support the sector. So speaking of which, speaking of rates, uh, what is it that we at the Fed are doing to try to support the recovery? So first, in order to, to support the economy and to ease credit conditions, we cut the federal funds rate to nearly zero, made additional asset purchase op purchases open-ended, excuse me, and noted last week that we plan to keep the federal funds rate low till the crisis passed. We also launched a panoply of programs to try to address the issues in credit markets that arose as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So without getting too deeply into the details of each and every program, let me just take the opportunity to provide some context for what we're trying to accomplish. In, in the case of the Fed's facilities, we essentially want to play our lender of last, um, lender of last resort function, but more broadly than just financial intermediaries in order to more directly influence liquidity needs throughout the economy. So the, the idea is to ensure that well-functioning companies can continue to operate and maintain employment to the extent that they are able. Uh, essentially, we don't want issues in the financial sector to amplify disruptions occurring on the real side of the economy. Uh, that's similar to what Walter Badgett advised in the late 1800s when he said that in order to avert a financial panic, central banks should lend freely against good collateral and at a penalty rate. <clears throat> so the indications that this is calm market and allowed companies to get access to the credit they need can be seen in credit spreads that have fallen from elevated levels, um, as well as with investment grade debt issuance, which is already at about the levels that we saw all of last year through just the first five months of 2020. Um, so let me conclude by talking quickly through the projections that Fed policymakers released last week. Despite significant stimulus, both from us and other parts of the federal government, the outlook, as I noted toward the top of the presentation, still seems weak. Policymakers expect to see significant declines in economic activity in 2020, consistent with what I showed you from the CBO. Their median projection is for GDP to decline by about 6.5% this year, with recoveries next year and in, um, and in 2022. Uh, however, despite what looked like relatively strong recoveries in the years beyond 2020, this projection implies that the economy won't return to pre-pandemic output levels until 2022, until into 2022. Uh, these projections also suggest that the unemployment rate will remain elevated for a few years. So Fed policymakers expect the unemployment rate to be below 10% by year end. The decline thereafter will be gradual so that by the end of the projection period in 2022, the unemployment rate will have fallen to only 5.5%, well above current estimates of the longer term natural rate of roughly 4%, and still above where we have been, um, where we had been rather, uh, in the economic expansion that just ended since 2015. Uh, similarly, projection policymakers expect weak economic activity to keep the rate of inflation low throughout the projection period and below the committee's 2% inflation objective. They see inflation falling below 1% this year and only approaching 2% by the end of 2022. So all of this adds up to the nearly unanimous expectation among Fed policymakers. And I should say that this, if you're not familiar with this chart, this essentially is the view of each of the um, individuals on the committee um, their view of where the federal funds rate is going to be uh, this year and in the, the next several years, as well as over the longer term. Um, so again, there, there's the nearly unanimous expectation among Fed policymakers at this point that the funds rate will remain at zero through the projection period, which is to say for nearly three years, which seems astonishing until you consider that the federal funds rate remained at zero for about seven years 
during and after the Great Recession. And as I indicated earlier, the declines that we've seen this time around have been even more pronounced than in that episode. I think the hope is that early action will mean that the economy will, will recover faster uh, and that the policy environment will normalize sooner uh, than in the last downturn. So that concludes my comments. With any time we have remaining, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Guhan. And uh, we will open up for questions. Uh, as I've uh, described in the past, we, uh, I can never see all the people, so I can't really rely on people uh, raising their hands. Um, so it, you may have to just speak up and try not to, and just obviously uh, be uh, considerate of other people who are speaking up. So anyhow, go ahead. Whoever wants the first question. CK CK uh, had a question. CK, go ahead, CK. Are you there, CK? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, uh, Gohan, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, what is your, can you express an opinion on the impact of the national debt? To the You're breaking up uh, CK, but I think Gohan may have got the mo majority of that. Yeah, so uh, with respect to the national debt, um, so that's clearly a concern. So if you think about um, where our, say, debt to GDP ratio was, where it's gone. So from, I think it's just between 2016 and fiscal 2019, the, uh, we saw a debt increase from roughly $600 billion annually to just under a trillion, um, the deficit, I should say. Um, and so debt levels, um, I think, have are projected this year to, to go up to 100% of GDP. They've been around 80%, the debt to GDP ratio. And spending this year is projected to be, if I remember correctly, for FY20, roughly $3.7 trillion. So if you think about, that's the deficit. So if you think about just the typical government spending in the course of a year, it's something on the order of $4.5 trillion. Um, so that's a substantial amount of deficit spending uh, in the current environment. It's, I think the way that I think it's clearly a substantial amount of spending. I think the way that I would think of it is what we and other policymakers are trying to do is to make sure that the kind of economic relationships that uh, exist are maintained to the extent possible. So you, there's kind of a call for there to be, you know, maybe more fiscal stimulus. Uh, and the idea here is that if you can try to keep as many of the economic relationships intact as possible, that's going to allow the recovery to um, occur more swiftly. So the idea here is you could either pay later in terms of a slower recovery because lots of economic relationships have been broken, or you can pay now in an attempt to try to maintain them uh, so that the recovery will occur more swiftly, hoping that overall, the kind of cost of the economy is going to be less because of early intervention. So that's an article of faith, but I think one way to think about this is that uh, you want, if you allow a lot of these economic relationships to be disrupted and it takes a long time for them to um, be reconstructed, that's kind of a hit to the productive capital of the U.S. Uh, and to the extent that you can make this kind of investment through fiscal policy, in limiting the damage to our productive capabilities or our productive capacity, it's kind of like an investment in our output over the longer term. So uh, it's a way of trying to maintain uh, our capital stock. So again, the recovery occurs more quickly. Maybe a simpler way to say this is that you could either pay now or you could pay later. Uh, the amount is substantial, there's no question about that, but the, it could be more costly uh, if you're not intervening pretty aggressively on the fiscal or monetary policy side. I have a question in, in sort of as a follow-up to what you have just been saying. Why would these tremendously large stimulus packages that Congress has been passing and looks like they want to pass even more, you know, trillions of dollars, why would that not increase inflation going down two, three, four years from now? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, so one of the things here is that 
you know, as you saw in the inflation projections, if you're getting kind of very limited spending, that's going to have implications for kind of pressure on prices. And right now, the concern is far more uh, about the fact that economic activity is going to be li limited. To the extent that it's limited, that's going to kind of keep a break on um, the rate of inflation. If you see like substantial spending, I mean, the other thing to sort of say that's in the background here is there's a question about how much of that fiscal policy stimulus is going to actually make it into uh, transactions is actually going to be spent. If it's all spent and you see kind of spending levels be maintained, that could start to have implications for inflation. But in, in the absence of that, if the money is in some sense not circulating as you know much as it may have in other circumstances, if there's kind of more concern and caution, that's going to kind of keep a break on price pressures and keep pressure on inflation limited. It's kind of what you see in the projections that I showed you a minute ago. So essentially the idea here is that limited economic activity, limited demand is going to continue to limit uh, upward pressure on prices. Could you tell us which industries are booming and are likely to be booming because of the pandemic, such as UPS and FedEx? I presume they're booming. What other industries are booming? Yeah, so I mean, I think on the, it's really on the technology side, I think that's where you're seeing entities doing better. So kind of a platform that we're on right now, that's an entity that's kind of doing well in the crisis. Any of these, I think, types of uh, services that are allowing us to connect virtually, those seem to be benefiting from the crisis. And I think that's going to likely be true over the longer term as some of these adjustments end up being more permanent. Um, so warehousing kind of to support e-commerce, um, uh, again, what you're seeing kind of with respect to technology and digital platforms, those are the kind of key things that come to mind. Thank you. Other questions? I see one from Steve Miller. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's a very good question. So, um, uh, I, I think. Re repeat the question, you know, the, please. We can all see it. Sure. I, I have um, unwittingly outed Steve. He actually sent this to me privately. Um, but I'll just say, uh, in the context of the kind of protest movements that we've seen around the country, um, there are a couple of things to say about this, I think. So, one is, you know, it, there, there are many things to say about it. So from an economic perspective, I think there's a little bit of a concern that some of the businesses that were already struggling, you know, so we've seen, you know, the, the protests and some of the violent protests have had an impact on small businesses throughout the country, which of course were already struggling as a result of the COVID crisis. That may be intensifying some of the pain for them um, and they were already sort of in a financially precarious position. So in many cases, if you think about the amount of cash that entities had on hand, these smaller entities, it's typically something on the order of one to two months. Um, so that's one reason to be a little bit concerned about this. The other thing to say is kind of related to what large gatherings could do for the pandemic and the prospect of potentially seeing a second wave, uh, which again is likely to have negative economic implications going forward. Uh, but having said all that, I think, um, you know, there, there, was a, there was an article recently in the New York Times about the economics profession. So uh, specifically about the economics profession and, and how it hasn't paid nearly enough attention to issues of um, racial inequality, uh, inequality more generally, but racial inequality in this case. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we've tried to pay more attention to this at the Fed, but as a profession in the last few years, but as a profession, I, I think that we probably haven't done as much as we ought to to sort of understand the underpinnings of um, kind of the, the systemic inequality that, that continues to be with us. So there's an interesting book 
uh, called The Color of Law, which kind of talks about how uh, racial segregation sort of has led to kind of lots of uh, lower um, wealth accumulation as well as worse educational outcomes for Black Americans and how that has had consequences for um, their economic prospects. So there are a lot of things to unpack here, but I think that broadly speaking, like the rest of the country, I think we're trying to come to grips with you know, these issues that have existed for a long time and making sure that we're responsive to them as well. And just to, to say one last thing about this, uh, clearly to the extent that we're not sort of effectively drawing on all of our citizens um, in terms of um, eliciting their contributions to the economy, that's gonna have negative implications for growth and for our economic prosperity over the longer term. So it's sort of a muddled answer there, I apologize. But. Hi, this is Dave Pritchard, I have a quick question. I guess uh, I've carried out this debate with some friends and, and uh, one, one counter I see to the idea that we aren't, that we aren't doing enough to educate certain groups is that, for instance, Columbus spends a lot more money per student on education than suburbs or small towns. And some of those other places have good results with less money. Um, is there an inherent excess expense in running big city schools or is it inherently more difficult to educate the students or any, any thoughts on that? That seems to be a core problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. It's a very complicated issue. So, um, so I'll say, um, you know, some of the challenges, so there's, there's good work that's been done on early childhood education from the Minneapolis Fed, among others. Um, so, you know, some of the issues here are kind of broader when you think about the disadvantages that individuals in, say, inner city schools, excuse me, face, it may require, it's, there's a little bit of an echo here with the conversation that we're having about policing in this country right now, where it's lots of issues that are not being effectively dealt with, say, in people's neighborhoods or at, in their homes, uh, leads to a lot of that uh, kind of, um, the attempt by us as a society to have those issues addressed by educators in one context, police in another context, um, which I guess has an echo of this kind of school to prison pipeline that some people talk about. So the, the reason I mentioned the early childhood education work is that um, the idea, there's the idea that if we spend effectively kind of in the early years of an individual's life, um, the educational interventions that come later are, are much more successful. If you have waited until people get to primary school, uh, get to kindergarten, first grade, by then in many cases, you haven't really set, um, you haven't really um, kind of set the neural pathways in place to allow people to effectively take advantage of uh, the education that they're going to get. That's setting aside all the social issues that typically uh, surround people in, in any city, inner city environments and inner city schools. Um, so, you know, that's one reason to think about how we fund education differently or thinking about kind of earlier interventions to make sure that what happens later is more effective. That could have the impact of kind of reducing the per pupil funding that we see in inner city schools uh, later on. Um, where, again, a lot of that money seems to be spent on some of the social pathologies that surround people in kind of lower um, quality neighborhoods or lower income neighborhoods, I should say. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, again, I think that it's sort of a broader issue about whether or not we are effectively kind of um, attending to kind of the broader set of needs, health related needs. Uh, nutrition needs, but also kind of making sure that early childhood education is kind of a key way in which we try to uh, address these issues so that what happens later in educational settings ends up being more productive.
Was that the objective of the Head Start program, though, that was started up oh, 30 years yes, ago? Yes, that's exactly right. That would have been the objective of Head Start, which I don't think is fully funded. So there's been kind of a movement uh, in many cities to fully fund universal pre-K, uh, but I don't think that um, we've gotten that either. Um, I think we've gotten sort of that, we've gotten that to some extent in various cities, but I don't think that we've gotten it universally um, or in uh, statewide. So I think there might have been a statewide initiative at some point, but I don't think that it's the case that we've got that statewide. So Guha, one of our members, Tracy Nahara, is is a uh, somewhat of an expert locally on that issue. I don't know if Tracy, if you want to jump in uh, for a, a quick uh, addition to uh, what Guhan offered there. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I would I would just offer up that early childhood investments are critical absolutely critical. But I would be careful in saying that increased investments in early, early um, care and education would offset, you know, later expenditures in K-12. It certainly can when it comes to special education, because early, um, early intervention in those years, like with speech pathology um, or any other identification, you know, can certainly, um, uh, it would provide some savings in terms of maybe later, more intensive intervention as a child enters school, but it's it's not a either or here, it's an and. And um, I do advocacy in both worlds. And so I, I try to make sure that people don't get into their minds that all we have to do is invest in early care and education and everything else will take care of itself. We can't make that argument because we have to remember that children live in families and children live in communities. And many times those families and those communities, they are underinvested. They don't have the community assets that maybe your suburbs or maybe wealthier urban or rural areas might have. So you're still trying to intervene in terms of hunger, um, baby parents not making a living wage, lack of transportation, all those other kind of social determinants of health, which could then be applied to social determinants of educational attainment. So I would just make that statement. Yeah, far more yes. articulate than what I offered, yes. John, uh, this is Tom Carlisi. Uh, before we end the session, I just want to express my gratitude to three people. One to uh, Guhan, the speaker. To me, this is a really engaging and enlightening conversation. And I'd like to segue to recognize Steve Heiser. He's in our club, but he's the Rotary District 6690 governor-elect. He just held, I think, the first ever online uh, district assembly over the week on last Saturday morning, and we had 163 participants from the district, and it was phenomenal. And our D Dana Volgemeyer was trying to onboard everybody. You know, <laughs> can you imagine that load? And Steve was helping, so it was our club was really well represented. But the last thing is, they had a call out that one of the urgent issues going on in the district is membership right now and how do you keep clubs afloat, especially maybe the smaller clubs that aren't even meeting right now. And I think this platform of this online program we do could be really useful for all the clubs in our district. I know we got a uh, shout out to that, but I'd recommend that the district membership uh, committee work with the Scott and Rotary to make sure that those clubs know this is available to them. I'd love to see more of them taking advantage of speakers like Guhan and others. So just want to, Steve, I don't know if you want to um, add anything to that, but I just want to express my gratitude, man. Well, thank you, Tom. And I want to quickly, we're going to run out of time here. So I want, is there any more questions specifically for Guhan about our economic situation? And uh, um, you know, so get back on track here for the uh, few minutes we have left. Anybody else have questions? Dave Pritchard with one last question. Uh, a lot of words, but it sounds like um, the problem is funding for education and uh, social services intervention that isn't there. Doesn't look like it's going to be there. And uh, how how do we how do we expect if that's the crux of the problem? Uh, it doesn't seem like it's old. Okay. Yeah, I'll just say. Um, so I think Tracy was far more articulate than I was, um, but. I, and I think I see in the notes there, some people are saying, or the chat rather, it's a sort of a matter of funding to an extent. So I, you know, offered early childhood ed, ed which I think is 
probably an important intervention, but that's not the whole story. So she was saying a little more complicated than that. Uh, and there are, you know, all kinds of issues to think about. So she mentioned kind of social determinants of health. This sort of maps to other ways in which we're deploying our fiscal resources. So you can think about healthcare more broadly, whether or not there's kind of broad access to that, high quality healthcare, high quality nutrition. Again, as she pointed out, other kinds of services that help support families and communities. Um, so, you know, I, I do think in, in broad strokes, it's kind of a matter of what we as a society decide is important. There is kind of research to support particular interventions, uh, but then it sort of is incumbent on us to determine how we, you know, elect to spend these dollars and what sort of choices we make in terms of um, the things that we want to prioritize. Thank you. Time for one more final uh, question for our speaker about the uh, economic uh, and the Fed. Anybody have one? Hearing then, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, spread the word. Uh, let other members, other folks join us. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, next week, as I mentioned earlier, will be a club assembly where we really set forth our goals and implement our uh, strategic plan and uh, some other matters. So. Hope, uh, hope a lot of you can join in because it is important to get lots of uh, input onto that process. Um, and, uh, and so thank you for everybody. Uh, you know, last week will be my uh, last final meeting, so I'll give my uh, parting words, I guess, next week. So we'll, uh, that alone should be uh, just for some way. Any case, thank you all for joining us today and uh, have, a great, have a great week. Right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Very much.